There was a time when the a population knew they were dependent upon what happened around them. Yeah. Darn right, you're going to respect those farmers, right? And there wasn't, you know, national or international supply chains, you know, of commodities moving around in boats and ships and trains. And, uh, and, and so there's an indifference because you don't see the, you, you can drive through farmland to the store and get your food and come back home wherever you live. And there's no connection between those farms and the, what you just purchased, nothing nothing at all. And so why would you be in gratitude? Right. There's no, no connection, you know. And the biggest food desert in the United States is not in Baltimore, Philadelphia, or Oakland. It's in the Midwest. Yeah. It's in the farmer community. They live in the food desert. They can't get anything at their stores. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from climate activist, author, and friend of the Real Organic Project, Paul Hawken. This is the fifth interview that we've done with Paul, and we're so excited to have him as the keynote speaker at our upcoming conference at EcoFarm on January 17th. We hope you will join us either live at Asilomar Conference Grounds in Monterey Bay, California, or through the live streaming option. All ticket holders will receive recordings so you can watch our many excellent speakers at your convenience. Now let's listen to our recent interview with Paul Hawken. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I'm very pleased today to be talking to my friend Paul Hawken, with whom I have done a number of interviews. And... Uh, he was kind enough to do another one. So, hi, Paul. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, so much to talk about. Since we last talked, Regeneration, your book came out and has gone far and wide. How are you feeling about that? It's such a intense labor to bring that to birth. And what happens after that? Yeah, it's a good question. What we do here at Regeneration and Project Regeneration is that we actually produce the whole book. And what I mean by that, um, uh, the layout, the font, the kerning, the letting, the photography. I mean, um, we send a thumb drive into the publisher, Penguin, and that goes to the printer. Now, of course, they have looked at the text in terms of their editors and legal, but we do the copy editing. We had a decolonization editor as well for, for the whole text. Um, so the good news is that we have control and we can change every edition if there's a typo or a mistake or in, uh, something that's not factual. The bad news for me was that we sent it in three months before publication. And so there was about two weeks, you know, I could off and then it went right into pre-publicity and that didn't stop of course the book was September 21 then the publicity really started so by the time you know it, Thanksgiving came around I was just burnt out because I had worked two years before that pretty much pretty much seven days a week every week for two years because of the deadline um, and so I was just like I say, burnt out, exhausted, you know, spent. And I don't think I realized it to a greater, a great extent until you look back on it. You know, you look back because, you know, you, you don't know, you know, you just think it's the new norm, and, but it was abnormal. So, t so my brain came back in about May. <laughs> and uh, it began to sort of, you know, look around and see what's going on in the world, just like everybody else does, you know, who cares about food and egg and climate and environment and biodiversity and water, etc. And I think just pretty much having the same experience right to this moment uh, of the interview of, of really seeing a, a profound shift in the zeitgeist in the world. 
and very much fear-based, uh, very understandable. Um, this is a torrid summer, uh, and that torridness is primarily heat and drought, but there's also uh, you know, 500,000 year floods occurring at the same time, which is, was always predicted um, by climate science in terms of the jet stream getting really wonky. Um, which it, of course, is. Uh, and so I, I, I wonder, and I ask the question myself and of others, you know, what is the point of intervention, if you will, not intervention like you're intervening in something that's happening, but points of intervention for human beings in terms of um, their, um, where they are right now. I'm not talking about deniers and people who are, you know, fascinated by demagogues and <clears throat> fascists. I'm just talking about most people. And, um, and when I say point of intervention, I mean, where, where does it connect? What, what's the connecting point for them? Um, when you're coming from the emotional, the amygdala, you know, from fear, panic, stress, worry, doubt, um, and when you're going into a world where there's been a real shift from climate being a concept, climate change, global warming, it's a concept, heard about it, know about it, probably right, you know, whatever, to one where it's experiential or vicariously experiential. I mean, you know somebody or your family or people or whatever is, that have been severely impacted by it. And so <clears throat> you feel that proximate um, sense of threat. And so I, I think about it a lot, you know, which is, it's, you know, when I did draw down, it was like, okay, here's your solutions, but they're what to do. I think what people really need is a deeper sensibility of possibility. Because I think in some ways the press, journalism uh, is doing what it does well, which is to get clickbait for you click throughs um, they have to and so they're writing articles that are very much about threat and very much about fear very much about what's going wrong and I don't argue with those articles so much as that they really start to foreclose upon people's um, sense of the future and they start to it's like you know um, putting animals in a pen, you know, horses in a pen, a small pen, you know, they get really, they don't like it, put it that way. And when they can't run around. And I think the same thing is happening to humanity, you know. And so I, I do think there has to be some way to communicate uh, about possibility in a pragmatic way. It makes sense, you know, I mean. But at the same time, there has to be a way for people to understand that we're locked in. This is the, the, the changes we're seeing are not locked in at the level that we're seeing this year. They're locked in at increasing levels for 30 years. And so it is about adaptation. It is about resiliency, but it's also about, you know, basically a longer view. And it's, I think it's difficult for people to have a longer view to invest in things that take a longer amount of time that do address global warming when in fact they're feeling the threat you know, in real time or in a shorter time span. Because it's so big and because it feels out of their control and, and on an individual level is out of their control. Well, it's out of everybody's control. Exactly. Yeah. It's not like if I just stopped using plastic bags, this would be resolved. Right, and it could end up, you know, making individual action uh, de minimis, you know, in that sense. Uh, like, well, I mean, it always was before anyway, in a sense. Uh, and I think that promoted a, an idea that somehow if governance could really take the reins on this one and in terms of policy, we have the Anti-Inflation Act that, is supposed to pass tomorrow in the House and be signed by President Biden. And it is the first time in 50 years that the United States has done anything about climate on a national level. So I think that 
that hope or expectation has been misplaced badly. I mean, obviously. And, and even around the world, you look at Australia, the big change in government, uh, governance because of the conservatives being in the thrall of coal and fossil fuel companies. But the new government so far has only just set goals like for 2030 and 2050, you know. And in that sense, they're no different than corporations who are setting goals, net zero goals, you know, like go, okay, good. <laughs> it's good to have goals. <laughs> but what matters right now is the next eight, 10 years, you know. And, and so it's really actions we need to see instead of goals. And um, there's just a real gap there between you know, aspiration, if you will. That's the nicest thing you can say about these goals. Uh, and uh, reality. And the reality is that, uh, you know, emissions are increasing. The emissions in 2021, just that year, 2.58 ppm, in order for us, you know, because you also see from the IPCC and oil companies and other people say, well, we're going to have, you know, direct air capture. We need a technological solutions. We need to, you know, basically suck that was their word, verb to, you know, carbon out of the air and, you know, liquefy it and put it in, you know, uh, geological deposits and caverns and so forth. And, but the, right now it's $600 a ton, but their goals are $100, $200 a ton, you know, like that they can do that, you know, 30, 40 million machines in the world turning around sucking air 24 <laughs> seven for decades. But right now, just to capture the CO2 that was emitted into the atmosphere in 2021, this is 2022, uh, would cost between 2.3 and $5.6 trillion. It just gets it back a year. And so this sort of pipe dream, you know, this idea that there's, there's it reminds me of, you know, uh, the Music Man, River City, you know, you know, sort of, let's go, you know, it, it, you know, providing a false sense of hope and, and, and I, I feel like that's happening as well, you know, and because there is a ready audience for it again, to, you know, to, to, there's something, is there something we can do? And people are talking about, you know, reflecting sunlight again, you know, as a viable thing, we probably have to do that, you know, and what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, people are talking about that and they don't even know how photosynthesis works and they're talking about reflecting sunlight, you know, and um, so it's into that that I think, you know, regeneration, which, you know, is really, to me, the through line of this planet, you know, it's not like we've come up with a slogan or a buzzword. I mean, people can make it a buzzword if they wish, but it's actually how our body works, how nature works, how the living world works, how the oceans work. They always have, they always will. And, uh, and so I don't feel like in the press and so forth, there, nobody's really holding up a mirror, you know, to each other or themselves in terms of this has a cause, you know, and the cause is our minds and our wants, our greed, our desires our assumptions, um, uh, consumption, of course, you know. Um, and that isn't really being talked about, you know, because it, it's being talked about as if there's something you can fix. And you cannot fix the climate crisis. You cannot. It's not fixable. The only thing we, us, people, farmers, and everybody else can do is create more life. That's it. That's the only thing that's going to change the biosphere, because the biosphere, I mean the atmosphere, the atmosphere and the biosphere are the same thing, just one's gaseous, one's material, but they're, they're inextricable. And so the, the, the journalism and the writing, you know, keeps sort of unintentionally, but nevertheless othering this problem, othering climate, othering as if climate was a thing instead of a, dyna a dynamic. 
But there's another dynamic, which is a cultural dynamic, a sociological dynamic. And that's the dynamic we have to look at because we are reinforcing that in we, I mean, corporations, advertisements, media, social media, etc., are reinforcing privilege, reinforcing more, reinforcing how we look, how we appear, what we have, where we can go, what we drive, what our houses are, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, you know, you look at that and go, if there isn't some sensibility that says, you know, actually we kind of have to stop and reflect and, and listen and measure, you know, where we are and who we are and what we do and the impact we have and act, you know, act. I mean, that's what an individual has to do it because she or he then is beginning something that can, you know, grow and move out into the world. But as long as um, we don't have that collective sense of reflection, self-reflection, you know, in some way, um, then I feel like uh, it's going to create a paucity of hope, if you will, or aspiration on a collective sense. And it's going to reinforce people's sense of, um, you know, we're screwed or there's nothing we can do or, you know, you know I'm moving to Vancouver, or, you know, whatever. I mean, those things where people think they can escape and of course there is no escape. So the impulse of most of our society is to see a technical shift that an electric car, a, a machine that will suck carbon. You're suggesting that the actual needed change, the needed evolution is our mind. Yes, absolutely. It's how we think, how we see. Look, we were all taught pretty much to see and think the way we do. It's innate in the English language even. We, I mean, for those of us who speak English, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a polyglot language. It's a mutt language, you know. Just because it came from England doesn't mean, it, it, you know, it's, it, it came from all different languages from all around the world. It has uh, Indo, uh, <clears throat> it's an Indo-European language that comes from all the way from Hindi to, you know, Danish to Angles and Saxons and, you know, all the different, you know, obviously, you know, French and Germanic influences were, in, you know, huge. But what just I'm saying is as a language, it has no sense of place. I mean, because it, it's it's lingua franca. It's the language of the world now. It's business, you know. It's science. And so I was on an interview two days ago with uh, about regeneration. The the, the Japanese um, edition is out, and with a magazine there. And I noticed that, you know, the names on the Zoom call, you know, and it was Fukushima Ayakawa. Yamashita, okay, Yamashita, Ayakawa, you know, Fukushima. That's an island of forest and a mountain. In other words, they didn't even, their surnames are their place their family came from. So most of the languages in the world very much had that sense of place as opposed to this sort of rootlessness that you see in the English language. It's rootless, you know. And it has got lots of words, you know, and it is very much a language of separation, disconnection, you know, of naming, you know, distinction, which is, makes it very valuable for science, very valuable. No question. As a writer, you got to fall in love with it in some ways, you know. I'm not saying it's more beautiful than French or writing in Spanish. I'm just saying is they have, you have more choices <laughs> and more inflections, you know, more nuance perhaps. But what it does is it, it actually sort of fractures our sensibility and connection to place and to nature and to each other and to the past and to culture and to family, to, you know, our roots. You know, it's like I said, rootless as a language. Um, and, you know, when I wrote Blessed Unrest, I, I have a dictionary. It's from the, the Yamana people. And they're the people who Darwin 
uh, called Beasts when he came around, you know, and HMS Beagle came around the Tierra de Fuego and saw these people. I mean, it was cold and they're naked and they had these little things with coals in them, you know, and they started fires, you know, and because um, they needed fire. And so they definitely carried fire around with them, but they did seal fat for their protection because clothing would cause them to get pneumonia, you know, so they actually didn't have clothes, okay? And they were seen as bestial, that's again Darwin's word, and uh, barely above sub, you know, barely above subhuman, okay? And there was a, um, lots of massacres of those people and disease, lots, but they put clothes on them, woolens, and they died quickly. And there was a missionary there and he was a lexicographer. That was his shtick, English in the words. And he decided to make a dictionary for the, from the Yamada people. And by that time, there was only 160 left. And, and, and the, the former chiefs and heads of the Yamada had all perished, but they always elected another person to be you know, their chief. And so uh, the missionary spent several years making a dictionary of the Yamana people. And the Yamana, the, he would not speak to them of, of, about women, about cosmology. There were certain things they just, they didn't trust him at all. So they, um, we won't talk to you, but we'll talk to you about everyday things. That dictionary got to 30,000 words. And it has more verbs in English and more metaphors. And it was Aristotle that said metaphor is genius. But if you actually look at the dictionary, um, and read it, and it actually, in the words, in the language itself, it teaches you how to live in that place on earth. In other words, the language is a teaching, it's biology, it's zoology, it's ichthyology, it's limnology. <laughs> it's all there, you know, in the language itself. So as you're growing up as a child, you know, you're learning um, this beautiful, beautiful, uh, metaphorical language, but metaphorical with very specific impl uh, implications as to what to do, when, and how, uh, in in order to survive. And they survived there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years until they um, got colonized, and then they're gone now. But so again, I just want to go back to language, not to say that we should strip off our clothes and put on, you know, seal fat. I'm talking about we have built into our way of thinking and processing information, uh, the uh, automatic but also unseen ways of making ourselves distinct and separate, even from ourselves. Right. So, if nature's over there and I'm here, nature's got a problem, it's not necessarily my problem. Right. Okay. So I see that, but as somebody who grew up in America and speaks one language, a second very, very poorly, I, I hear what you're saying, but in terms of action, of um, do we begin the, the process of transformation interpersonally, or do you think we begin it internally in other words is it is it more likely to come about i'm sure it's not either or but by sitting quietly or is it more likely to come about because you talk to me and i go i never thought of that it really depends on the person their background their it, you know it can start with a i mean a farmer often can do it themselves simply by the fact that if, if you're not a farmer that basically is a chemical manipulator, okay, in other words, you're manipulating, you know, different chemicals, you know, on a substrate, which is your so-called soil, um, then you're a technical, you're, you're a technical um, expert uh, and you're working with other advisors who have technical expertise and you're manipulating these things in order with, you know, with seasons and rain and all that sort of stuff, you know, in order to produce, you know, a commodity, a crop, income, etc. Okay. 
But if you actually are, are an organic or regenerative farmer in the true sense of both words, by the way, um, it then actually, as Wendell Berry has pointed out many times, I mean, you, it, it's, it's eyes per acre. <laughs> you, 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 walk, you walk your fields, you know, you walk your perimeters, you walk beyond it, you know, you, you take in this information. And you know the names of the pollinators and the birds, you know, you know the names of the type of soils, you know the names uh, of, you know, the, 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 you can look up and, and look at and know what weather's coming. You don't have to go to your satellite. You can just see it because it always, it's always telegraphed. Um, and um, so in that way, you're imbuing yourself. Maybe you grew up with your father or mother that way and they did it, you know, who knows. But the point being is you have that sensibility as opposed to being learned, you know, from book learned or you don't get it at, you know, Texas A&M, you know, you just don't. That's, that's the technical side, you know. Now that's changing, you know, dramatically, but I still think it's being changed from the point of view of, you know, that kind of farming is a technique. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. But it, you know, as I think every great farmer knows, you know, well, yeah, but this is here, this is now, this is this, this soil, this place. I mean, you know, this rainfall pattern. So it's always becomes very specific, again, to place and crop and soil and weather. And so that's one way for people who are, you know, city people, you know, suburbanites, uh, then I think it, 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 there has to be, there has to be, I'm assuming anybody has to be, but I mean, there needs to be a, 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 a stopping, in other words, a ceasing, uh, a, a, a quietness, you know, a, like, don't do anything. <laughs> and see what comes up, really. And of course, as you know, Jack Cornfield's pointed out, you know, when you first stop doing that, you know, you'll feel like you're trapped in a Motel 6 all night watching, you know, the shopping channel. I mean, your mind will just go back and forth and repeat, 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 you know, the same little, you know, crap is being sold every hour. I mean, the thing is, that's what the mind does. And uh, we know how the mind works in that sense. And, but you need time in order to let that, you know, fade away and so um and it in that not fade away but just to this was called mindfulness a word that's been overused i think in or misused but that awareness of mind then is an awareness that can then when when it goes to what is a so-called objective not you know not the mind's thoughts but to the world, it, there's a clarity, there's a seeing, there's an understanding that was covered up, you know, that was obscured by our busyness, by um, our needs, which are in almost all cases very valid, not always, but or what we perceive as needs. And so that's internal, that, that comes from the inside. And, and as I said, the, the good thing about the global warming and the impacts it's going to have uh, becoming experiential as opposed to conceptual is it is it does bring people to a, a deeper level of thoughtfulness about it as opposed to you read about it, hear about it, okay, fine, but then you go on and do what you have to do that day and have to get done and, or want to get done or all three. And, uh, but when something intervenes the way uh, global warming is intervening in people's lives and crops and farms and rivers and water and, you know, and homes uh, today uh, and health, you know, and death, um, that's a different experience, you know? So that's, like I said, that's the good news and the bad news. It's the same thing. Um, there's a book that I just read called um, Healing Grounds by Liz Carlisle. And it's looking at a lot of uh, traditions of indigenous agriculture. And it, it, it is focused not entirely, but a lot on farming as done in this country by women of color. 
And, um, I, you know, I really kind of puzzled about it because uh, it has a reverence for all of those traditional techniques and some of them I'm going, I'm not, I'm not so sure about the burning part. Um, I understand it was very sustainable with a certain population on a certain land base, but I don't know that I think it's, it's a great technique. But as I got through the book, I came to appreciate that, that Liz was really describing a way of thinking, not a series of techniques. Mm. And that way of thinking uh, was very different from the way of thinking that I'm accustomed to or that I was raised and trained in. And there was something very exciting there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I think that real organic farming is a different way of thinking. And maybe the problem it's facing now is that Industrial agriculture isn't a different way of thinking from that sort of uh, uh, corporate paradigm that, that rules so much of our world. Well, I mean, it's true, you know, the, the um, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand years ago in, you know, in, in Mexico, I mean, you know, highly forested areas and sl they used slash and burn. No question about it. And as well as in Asia, you know, in um, um, it worked. It worked fine. But we have to always look at the relationship between the number of people and the place, not just as a technique that is valid, you know, given different environmental uh, circumstances. And the the thing that's changed, of course, is the number of people. And of course, that is what is invoked by every commodity chemical ag company in the world you know there's so many of us we have to use it if we don't go this way then people will starve you know which is just complete nonsense but but it it is a nonsense in the in the sense that you cannot farm in necessarily in ways that were farmed in the past simply because the demand is greater you know yeah. and so um but there's a lot to be learned from them which is really um they they're in farm fertility even if the way to create fertility was to abandon it for 10 20 years <laughs> come back yeah. i mean it's still they, they 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 knew what they needed you know yeah. which is take the fertility okay we've taken too much go leave it alone yeah it's a way of cover cropping yeah, like a 10-year cover crop, 20-year cover crop. 20-year cover crop. Yeah. And, you know, for somebody who, you know, we're hearing some chainsaws, but if you don't have a chainsaw, or you don't even have a bow saw, mm. then how do you clear land for agriculture to eat? So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning that as a, as a bad technique, but I think it could be a bad technique, technique to replicate in... A different situation with a different scale and a different a number of mouths to feed and not the ability to have a 20-year rotation right and that's why you said it's really a way of seeing and thinking not a, not the technique itself is not the it's not the, the all critical the thing the critical thing is a, a whole different relationship to the land to to the air to each other yeah i mean F. H. King's, you know, farmers of forty centuries. I mean, it was all night soil. I mean, you, you return, you know, human waste back to the, to the soil, you know. And you, if you didn't do it, it was at your peril. I mean, that was your. I loved the story of the farmers who would build, compete for the nicest outhouse on the side of the road, hoping travelers would go. Oh, I'll come leave some night soil here because this is such a nice, nice place to sit. Exactly, <laughs> nitrate and urea free yeah i mean so that obviously is a big change you know I and mean, that was very much about in-farm fertility for thousands of years you know and they didn't have the same density or um dependency on animals you know so and the fish which were actually alive in the rice fields 
so they had uh, fish in, but they were they were fertilizing as they ate the algae and mosquitoes and whatever in the in the fields. So in the rice fields, so patties. It's my understanding that now they've become some of the worst of industrial agriculture in China, some of the worst of chemical, which is a sign that it's not like you just get it right and then you've got it right. This is a constant process of renewing your vows over and over. Gosh, you know, uh, you may know Warren Weber. He's a great... Uh, I just interviewed him this morning. Okay, well, Warren went there uh, with a, another friend. He went to China. This is years, you know, decades ago. And interested to look at, you know, organic farming in China. <laughs> and, um, and when they got there, they found that... Um, the Chinese were embarrassed about, in other words, organic farming was the past. It was seen as um, primitive and like, you know, and that they didn't even want to show them or see farms that were still farmed that way. You know, they wanted to show them their you know, chemical act uh, uh, to show that they were modernizing and that they're part of, you know, the new world, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, the irony of that is inescapable. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, w we learn slowly. I, I was in China once at a banquet and I was sitting with a group of people and I, I, I think I was talking to a reporter or something, but, uh, this person had no English, I had no Chinese. Mm. So we were having fun communicating and drawing pictures and he wanted to know what I did for a living. And I finally got across that I grew food. I was a peasant. And he was almost insulted. <laughs> he was upset right. because he didn't think that was a, a, a very uh, prestigious job. That's true in China, but in Japan that was not true. Mm -hmm. In Japan, the merchant was underneath the, the farmer in mm. terms of a status. Yeah. Uh, so there was an appreciation, you know, for agriculturalists and farmers that that somehow, I don't know if it was that way in China one time and maybe got lost, but certainly it's true today. And I think in, even in Japan today, I mean, the same thing is true. I don't think there is that respect for the farming community. So maybe that kind of respect is part of that different mindset of uh, certainly that was what the book was suggesting is a respect for people who are seeking to farm in a different way. And they, they would, in the book, use the term regenerative, not yeah. the term organic. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was a time when the a population knew they were dependent upon what happened around them. Yeah. Darn right, you're going to respect those farmers, right? And there wasn't, you know, national or international supply chains, you know, of commodities moving around in boats and ships and trains. And, uh, and, and so, there's an indifference because you don't see the, you, you can drive to farmland to the store and get your food and come back home wherever you live. And there's no connection between those farms and the, what you just purchased, nothing, nothing at all. And so why would you be in gratitude? Right. There's no, no connection, you know. And the biggest food desert in the United States is not in, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Oakland, it's in the Midwest. Yeah. It's in the farmer community. They live in the food desert. They can't get anything at their stores. Yeah. Doritos. Yeah, Mountain Dew, raspberry Mountain Dew. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the new one. So I, I, we started to talk about it before, but I wanted to ask you, um, you wrote an important book called Regeneration, and more than the book being important, the idea in it is important. And um, 
And at the same time, there have been a lot of forces in the world adopting that word for their 30 year plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all the major food corporations and big ag corporations now claim the title regenerative. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I can't think of one that wouldn't make you flinch. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I, and I, I understand that there is a real regenerative movement out there, but you know, there's also, I would have to say a fake regenerative movement. I don't think it's anything about the word regenerative. I think no matter where we go, if we try to build a movement around an idea and enough people get excited about it and are willing to support it financially, there are forces whose like a shark, they sense the blood and they're hardwired to go for the blood. Yeah, In this case, I, the blood is money. Yeah, true. I look at it a little bit differently, but it doesn't contradict what you're saying at all. Um, the fact is that in a sensitized world, which it is, um, corporations have to renew their social license pretty often now. And if they don't, then it does have financial impact because it's a reputational impact, it's a generational impact, it's a consumption or patronage impact, you know, people buying, not buying. And corporations are very sensitive to that, you know. Um, And because it affects their share value and investment and the whole thing starts to fall apart if you aren't growing and you don't have support from your customer. So um, it's almost like once that snowball started rolling down the hill, you know, almost no corporation had a choice. You know, it's like, it's just like here when you, your, your certain birthday here in California, you know, you gotta renew your license. You don't have a choice. It's the same. I don't think they had a choice. Now, the thing is about hypocrisy, which, I'm not saying any one corporation is a hypocrite, but I want to talk about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the way human beings oftentimes first try out the truth. They don't believe it, but they just say it. Because they're in a situation where they better say it, or if they say something otherwise, it's going to, they're in trouble. And, um, it's just the way humans are, you know? And so I have no doubt that, you know, a extraordinary percent of commitments to regeneration depends on the most, you know, unwieldy of definitions or concepts of what it means. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, I do think that the meaning of it will, that penny will drop, it will come home. They're gonna see. They're going to understand that, if I can use the French word, oh, shit. Actually, this is what we have to do, as opposed to this is a good thing to do, the right thing to do, you know, the politically correct thing to do, or, you know, sociologically, e- ecologically. No, we have to do this. And what I'm seeing in companies is uh, that I respect who are using the word with respect to agriculture anyway, um, is uh, a sense of pragmatism. In other words, this is the pragmatic thing to do because the everything is changing. And farms right now are not resilient. They're actually getting more fragile. And um, and more uh, susceptible. Uh, the soils that used to be, you know, reservoirs, the biggest reservoir of uh, in, on earth is soil, not some dam or lake. And that those reservoirs are empty. And so that means the farms are more uh, susceptible to too much water, too little, because the soil is compacted, you know, it doesn't absorb water well, doesn't keep it, so you get erosion or there's too little and you have no, your crops fail. And so 
to me, moving towards regenerative agriculture, one of its manifestations is its capacity for water infiltration, of course, and you know, and to hold that water. Uh, and so I see it on an agricultural level as, as companies realizing that, that the agricultural system is very vulnerable and that regeneration is starting to uh, address the cause of those vulnerabilities uh, and the source of resilience. And that's going to hold true for pollinators uh, as well. It's going to hold true uh, for crop health. In other words, uh, it's like nobody really has a monoculture here, but they have a, a you know a one-two rotation: corn, soy, corn, soy, which is like a two-year biennial monoculture. <laughs> you know, uh, seeing that that doesn't fly, it won't fly, you know, it's still mining the soil and that the soil is reaching limits, you know, in terms of, and the rise in fossil fuel prices and energy prices also then highlights the dependency on natural gas and, you know, ammonia and, and nitrates and, uh, and the cost. So again, like, you know, I can imagine somebody saying, in farm fertility, what's that? You know, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I mean, the, that divorced from the idea that you could have a farming practice, you know, that basically is completely independent or highly independent from uh, uh, exogenous inputs, you know. And I mean, we're photographing and, you know, we're recording here and, to your right and my left is just this extraordinary forest. And, you know, it's never been fertilized yet. <laughs> Nobody sprayed it. <laughs> Nobody put, you know, superphosphate or, you know, I mean, so the idea of in-farm fertility is, is just in our face, you know. But it takes a very different type of farmer and, 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 and way of understanding that relationship between agriculture and place and soil. Yeah, and um, but I think I think that the vulnerability, the supply chain vulnerability, the weather vulnerability, the vulnerability of uh, energy prices, and even uh, uh, supply of energy in terms of natural gas, um, is going to have a profound effect on sort of a, a kind of a, a come to Jesus moment for a lot of corporations like. Oh, those guys actually were onto something, or that actually, you know, that kind of makes sense, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, sort of, you know, saying things or advertising things, you know, I mean, that just look good, sound good, you know, sloganeering and uh, trying to get your social license renewed, even though you didn't take a driver's test. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and a review so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 98. Please join us next time for the second half of our interview with climate activist and author Paul Hawken. He's our keynote speaker at the upcoming conference in California at EcoFarm on January 17th. To support this podcast and our certified farms, become a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org. 